1988, Who Framed Roger Rabbit came out, and it truly was an amazing movie. This exciting caper shows a thrilling adventure that mixes live footage with animation, blending the two seamlessly in an adventure set in LA in the 1940s, which explores a murder mystery, which also features cartoon characters of that era, finding a common ground interest in both children and grown-ups alike. It's both thrilling and captivating, and I can still remember being a kid when Who Framed Roger Rabbit came out, and I absolutely loved it, and I just couldn't get enough of it. If there was something that had Roger Rabbit's face on it, I just had to get it. And even now as a grown-up with no hair, I still can't get enough of this movie, and its magic never fails to amaze me. So today we are going to explore Roger Rabbit once again by looking into 10 more things that you didn't know about Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yes, this is a follow-up episode to a previous one, with 10 new things that you didn't know. So let's head down to Toontown once again as we check it out. Number 10. Serial mascots influence the creation of Roger Rabbit. Roger Rabbit was created by American author Gary K. Wolf for his 1981 novel Who Censored Roger Rabbit, which unlike the subsequent movie was actually quite dark. I've already spoken about the novel in the previous episode, where I explain there are tons and I mean tons of differences between the book and movie. But here's a quick recap. In the book, Roger Rabbit is a walking, talking, living, breathing comic strip character. Yeah, comic strip character, not a movie star like in the movie. Who lives in a world where humans and comic strip characters coexist. And Roger is more of a secondary character to Baby Herman, who is the true star of the comic. Where Roger hires private detective Eddie Valiant to try and discover why the producers of the comic strip he stars in haven't delivered on their promise to give him his own comic strip where Roger is murdered by way of censoring, and Eddie teams up with Roger's stunt double, because in this world, Toons can create their own stunt doubles through mental energy. The Toon stunt doubles are basically clones of the Toons who create them, and even share their memories and personalities. But the stunt doubles disintegrate in time. And yes, the book ends with Roger dying, in a weird twisted plot full of murder, revenge, and deception, in which the main villain is a genie. Yeah. Oh, and unlike the movie which is set in the 1940s, the novel is set when it was published, in the early 80s. So where did this unique and bizarre concept come from? Well, growing up, Wolf was a fan of comic books and science fiction stories, and before Who Censored Roger Rabbit, he had already written several books. However, one morning he was watching cartoons to help find ideas and inspirations for his next book where he saw several breakfast cereal commercials, and was fascinated by the animated cereal mascots, mainly being Tony the Tiger and Trix Rabbit. He was fascinated that in the commercials, real live action children were interacting with the cartoon characters, but didn't question it, but rather just going along with it, as if the advert's universe was a place where anamorphic animated cereal mascots were just a thing. This led to the creation of Roger Rabbit, he used this idea of walking, talking cartoon characters and gave it a pulp and true crimes comic twist, which created the interesting and unique world of Who Censored Roger Rabbit. And I think it's important to note that this was a crime mystery story. Who Censored Roger Rabbit wasn't designed to be a tale of fun cartoons living in the real world for kids, but rather more of a pulp crime mystery with a twist. After all, if the first edition of the book is anything to go by, the original title was Who Censored Roger Rabbit? A Mystery. Number 9. Robert Zemeckis was originally turned down as director. So it seemed that with the publication of Who Censored Roger Rabbit that Hollywood was showing interest, particularly Walt Disney Productions. 
In 1981, the very year that the book came out, the president of Disney, Ron W. Miller, bought the rights to the book and greenlit a Roger Rabbit movie, hoping that the movie would be a huge hit for the company. Now, if you look at Disney movies at that time of the late 70s and early 80s, it was a period where they were trying to release big extravagant movies full of special effects and spectacle, but they weren't really having much success in the box office. The writing duo of Jeffrey Prince and Peter S. Seaman were commissioned to write the script. Beforehand, they had written the screenplay for a Disney comedy called Trench Coat in 1983. And after Who Framed Roger Rabbit, they would also co-write Doc Hollywood and the movie version of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. There was one young director who was very interested in directing Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and that was its eventual director, Robert Zemeckis. But not yet. You see, when he approached Disney to direct the movie, they turned him down, because at the time he had only directed two movies, those being I Wanna Hold Your Hand and Used Cars, both of which were flops. So he was basically told thanks, but no thanks. If only there was a science fiction comedy about time travel, which would go on to become one of the greatest movies of all time that Zemeckis could direct and make them change their minds. Oof. Number 8. At one stage, Roger Rabbit sounded more like Pee Wee Herman. So in the very early days of production, some test footage was put together, so the studio could get a feel of how Who Framed Roger Rabbit could be made. After all, it was a very ambitious film that'll have live-action people interacting with animated cartoons. Yes, Disney had mixed animation with live-action before several times, but Who Framed Roger Rabbit was a whole new level. Originally in the novel, Roger was described as being covered in brown fur with a white fluffy chest, but it was decided to make him a white rabbit and resemble Disney and Warner Brothers cartoons of the 1940s. However, in some of these early tests, he still wasn't quite Roger as we know him, mainly due to his big red nose. What's also fascinating about the early test footage is that Roger was voiced by none other than Pee Wee Herman himself, Paul Rubens. And he actually does a good job, and you could hear that it's the genesis for what Charles Fleischer would do with the part when he voiced the character. Also in these test scenes, Peter Renaday would play Eddie Valiant. Renaday would go on to voice Master Splinter in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon, and voice actress Lucy Taylor voiced Jessica Rabbit, who also voiced Minnie Mouse and several Simpsons characters. In some later test footage, the character Roger had started to resemble more what we finally got. Although in this test footage, we see a much younger Eddie Valiant, as opposed to the slightly older Bob Hoskins who would be cast, which makes me wonder if the character of Eddie was intended to be younger. Number seven, a budget decrease got the movie back on track. So for a while, the Who Framed Roger Rabbit production somewhat went dormant and faded out and was abandoned for a few years. It was Disney's new CEO of the time, Michael Eisner, who got the movie back into production, and he contacted Steven Spielberg along with his Amblin production company to produce the movie, which would have seemed like a logical choice at the time, as Amblin had produced many successful family movies, including Gremlins, The Goonies, and Back to the Future. Spielberg got a lot of creative control over the production and convinced other animation companies like Warner Brothers and Fleischer Studios to lend their characters for the movie, despite it being a Disney production. Deals were made provided certain conditions were met, like Bugs Bunny had to share the screen with Mickey Mouse and Daffy Duck had to share the screen with Donald, so they'll all get equal screen time, as well as Warner Brothers Looney Tunes voice artists returning to lend their voices for Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So with deals being struck, there was still a further setback, that being the budget, as Disney weren't happy with the movie's planned $50 million budget, finding it too expensive, so the budget was narrowed down to $30 million, which really got the ball rolling on the movie's production. The next big step was finding a director. Former Monty Python member Terry Gilliam was offered to direct. After all, he proved to be a visually ambitious director thanks to Time Bandits and Brazil. But he turned the offer down, finding the idea of it to be too technically complicated. He would later regret the decision, saying that he was just being lazy. So the production turned to the very director who wanted to direct the movie from the start, Robert Zemeckis, as by this stage he had already proven himself to not just be a competent director, but also an amazing director, due to directing Romancing the Stone, but more importantly, his 1985 super hit movie, Back to the Future. 
and legendary animator Richard Williams was brought in as the animation director. And so now the ship had set sail for the Who Framed Roger Rabbit movie. By the way, I love the music at the start of that film. You know, the one that goes boom, 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 boom. Number six, alternative titles. So as mentioned, writers Jeffrey Price and Peter S. Seaman were brought on board to write the script in the production's early days. And when the production was back on track, they were brought in again to do rewrites. I mentioned in my first episode that the whole concept of the Cloverleaf Company taking over the streetcar transit, along with its political corruption of that subplot, was based on issues that were taking place during the 1940s, as well as the 1974 movie Chinatown. However, during the writing process, there were other abandoned ideas and subplots. For example, originally it was conceived that either Jessica Rabbit or Baby Herman would turn out to be the movie's true villain, till the character Judge Doom was created. There was also going to be a subplot where it's revealed that Judge Doom had in fact killed Bambi's mum. <laughs> then we get the Toon Patrol, otherwise known as the Weasels, which consisted of five characters. Those being Greasy, Wheezy, Smartass, Stupid and Psycho. They were originally designed to be like a bizarro version of the Seven Dwarfs from Snow White. And there were originally seven Weasels, the other two being Slimy and Sleazy, but they were written out. I found some early designs for Jessica Rabbit and my first thought was, oh wow, they originally made her look more human. Then I saw a complete shot of her full body of this design and I then subsequently thought, okay, maybe not. As we all know, there are lots of famous cartoon faces who appear in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, including Dumbo, Betty Boop, as well as Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse as mentioned. However, other well-known popular cartoons of the 40s were also going to appear in the movie, but ultimately didn't. These include Popeye, Felix the Cat, Mighty Mouse, Tom and Jerry, Casper the Friendly Ghost, and even Superman, presumably in his animated Max Fleischer form, among many other potential characters. Speaking of cameos, the really screamy, shouty, irate director that we see at the start of the movie was played by real-life producer Joel Silver, who's produced many movies over the years, including Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, and Predator. And it was also decided to not use the original book's title of Who Censored Roger Rabbit. My guess would be because as the script progressed, it didn't really resemble the book that much anymore. Before settling for Who Framed Roger Rabbit, other titles were considered, including Eddie Goes to Toontown, Murder in Toontown, Trial in Toontown, Trouble in Toontown, and my personal favourite, Dead Toons Don't Pay Bills. <laughs> I love it. Although I would imagine that a dead anything wouldn't be able to pay bills. And so the movie's title was finally changed to Who Framed Roger Rabbit. You know, my memory actually has memories of Tom and Jerry being in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. When I watched that movie as a kid, I could swear there were scenes with Tom and Jerry somewhere. Honestly, I could have sworn they were in it. Damn that Mandela effect up to its usual tricks. Number five, other casting possibilities. So as I mentioned in the first episode, Bill Murray was originally offered the role of Eddie Valiant, but the production couldn't track Murray down, and Tim Curry was offered to play Judge Doom, but it was felt that he was too scary. However, there were other actors considered for the parts. When it came to the Eddie Valiant character, actors who were considered include Harrison Ford, Chevy Chase, Eddie Murphy, Robin Williams, and, um, Sylvester Stallone. It was Spielberg who cast British actor Bob Hoskins as Valiant, because he felt that Hoskins looked like he was from the 1940s, and felt that he had a hopeful, optimistic presence. As for the role of the villainous Judge Doom, many actors were also considered for the part, including Christopher Lee, Roddy McDowell, Sting, and Peter O'Toole. Wow, they really wanted the part to be British, didn't they? However, Christopher Lloyd was cast in the part, as he had previously starred as Doc Brown in Back to the Future, so he already had a working relationship with both Zemeckis and Spielberg. And whenever he was on camera, Lloyd claimed that he never blinked. Ugh, wow. Actor and comedian Charles Fleischer was cast in the title role of Roger Rabbit, and Kathleen Turner voiced Jessica Rabbit. She also previously worked with Zemeckis in Romancing the Stone, and she actually wasn't credited for her voice work for Jessica Rabbit for some reason. 
It's interesting that they originally wanted British actors to play the bad guy, because the hero, who is American, ended up being played by a Brit, and the villain, who is supposed to be British, ended up being played by an American. They kind of did a bit of a switcheroo there. <laughs> Number four, budget issues nearly shut the movie down. Despite the fact that the movie is based in Los Angeles, a huge chunk of Who Framed Roger Rabbit wasn't filmed in Hollywood, apart from some scenes. But instead, most of the film was actually shot in England, namely Elstree Studios near London, the same studio where the Star Wars and Indiana Jones movies were filmed. The main reason the crew packed up to film in the UK is because the movie's animation supervisor, Richard Williams, didn't want to work under Disney's thumb, as he didn't like the bureaucratic nature of the company, and thus didn't want to work in LA, where a Disney UK animation facility was set up in London. However, Who Framed Roger Rabbit may have been many wonderful things, but something it definitely was, was expensive. When you think about it, Who Framed Roger Rabbit was something of an experiment that was doing things never done before in movies, in terms of pushing the capabilities of animation interacting with live action footage. And so naturally, the budget kept increasing. It went from its intended $30 million to $40 million and then $50 million, where Disney CEO Michael Eisner then got cold feet and considered shutting down the movie's production entirely. Despite the fact that he was actually a driving force for getting the production off the ground. Thankfully, there was some common sense at work, as Disney chairman Jeffrey Katzenberg insisted that the show must go on, and that the production of Who Framed Roger Rabbit must continue, for if anything, because he was excited about working with Steven Spielberg. That fact alone kept the production alive. Well, I guess if it's the 80s and you want your movie to be a sure hit, success is guaranteed if you have the director of Jaws, E.T. and Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, that's kind of a given. Number three, post-production quirks. So once filming was complete for Who Framed Roger Rabbit, it was over to special effects company Industrial Light and Magic, who were working on adding the animation to the filmed footage, as well as making the animation two-dimensional rather than appearing flat, complete with shadows, rendering, and grading ensuring that this looks like a legit world of both live action and animation, and that the two can interact. The most difficult sequence to animate was Jessica Rabbit singing Why Don't You Do Right at the Ink and Paint Club, on the account that her dress had to be animated, but also have flashy sequins. The effect came from the strangest place, a plastic bag, as steel wool was used to scratch little tiny holes in the bag, and thus putting filter light through the bag to come up with the effect. Yeah, it's kind of technical, and I'm not very good at explaining technical things, but, uh, yeah, a plastic bag. The music for Who Framed Roger Rabbit was composed by Alan Silvestri, who is a frequent collaborator with Robert Zemeckis, with the music being conducted and performed in London by the London Symphony Orchestra. The music in the movie was heavily influenced by 1940s music, giving it a jazzy sound, which also sounds like 1940s noir and the more cartoonish sounding music was influenced by the works of Carl W. Stalling, who composed many of the old Looney Tunes cartoons. Speaking of music, going back to the scene where Jessica Rabbit is singing Why Don't You Do Right, the song was not performed by Kathleen Turner, who voiced the character, but was actually sung by Steven Spielberg's wife at the time, Amy Irving. Who Framed Roger Rabbit was going to be released under the Walt Disney banner, but Michael Eisner and Disney chairman Roy Disney, aka Walt Disney's nephew, felt that the movie was a little too naughty, with its adult and sexual themes and subject matter, and thus they wanted certain scenes to be cut out to make it cleaner. But Zemeckis didn't want to make these cuts, and Zemeckis did have the last say on how the movie would be cut. So in order to keep everyone happy, Who Framed Roger Rabbit was instead released under the Touchstone Pictures banner, which was a sub-company of Disney which focused more on mature movies for an older audience. And so Michael Eisner was happy, Robert Zemeckis was happy, Mickey Mouse was happy, and I was happy. <laughs> Number 2, the second highest earning movie of 1988. 
Who Framed Roger Rabbit was released in June 1988 and was an instant hit and got great praise from critics and audiences alike, with many calling it groundbreaking and Roger Ebert going as far as calling it a breakthrough in craftsmanship. It'll earn over $351 million on its $50 million budget, proving that the budget increase paid off and it became the second highest earning movie of 1988, behind Rain Man, as well as the 20th highest grossing movie of all time, and it would go on to win three Academy Awards. It was also the highest opening for a Disney movie in the UK for its time. I can remember it clearly. The world went crazy for Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and in 1988, that rabbit was everywhere, and had become a pop cultural phenomenon, one that was here to stay. And Roger Rabbit's theatrical run didn't end there, as several Roger Rabbit shorts were produced and released theatrically with other Disney movies. The animated shorts were fun and slapstick with the energy of a classic Looney Tunes cartoon, and promised an interesting franchise of Roger Rabbit animated shorts. However, the animated shorts were cut, well, short. Here's what happened. The first short was called Tummy Trouble, and was released with Honey I Shrunk the Kids in 1989. The second was Roller Coaster Rabbit, and was released with Dick Tracy in 1990. Now this is where the waters get mudded, as Spielberg, who owned 50% of the rights of Roger Rabbit, wanted Roller Coaster Rabbit to be shown at the start of Arachnophobia, which was a movie that he produced, but instead Disney placed it with the as mentioned Dick Tracy. So, probably out of annoyance, Spielberg cancelled the production of a third short, which was called Hair in My Soup, as well as a further three shorts that were in the planning stages. I kind of think it's a shame, as the Roger Rabbit brand probably could have grown even more from there and maybe could have led to more movies and other Roger Rabbit content. Who knows, maybe we'll still be having Roger Rabbit shorts at the start of movies now. Oh well, I guess it just wasn't meant to be. And pff, that's all she wrote. There was no more Roger Rabbit. Except there nearly was. Number 1. Abandoned Sequel So ever since the release of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, there have been plans for a sequel, where audiences can once again go on more wacky adventures with the lovable rabbit. According to Wikipedia, there was a script written by J.J. Abrams in 1989, but this sequel was scrapped. Then there was another sequel which was actually a prequel called Roger Rabbit and the Toon Platoon, which focused on a younger Roger who lives on a farm and sets out on a quest to find his parents, where he goes out on his adventure with a human character called Richie Davenport, and along his travels he meets his future wife Jessica, who was called Jessica Krumpnik, where Roger and Richie join the army to fight in World War II, where Jessica is kidnapped by Nazis, where Roger and Richie and a rogue gang of toons head out to occupied Europe to save Jessica. And the story ends with Roger saving the day and the revelation that his dad is... um... Bugs Bunny? Spielberg eventually left the production as he didn't want to make light of the Nazis after making Schindler's List, and over the years more rewrites would take place, to the point where the World War II subplot was removed entirely, and the movie was now called Who Discovered Roger Rabbit, and was more about Roger's rise to fame. Test footage for this sequel slash prequel was produced, which interestingly takes more of a CGI approach rather than the traditional animated one. But the test footage didn't impress the higher-ups at Disney, with Michael Eisner cancelling the film altogether. As the 2000s went on, several people associated with Roger Rabbit, included Robert Zemeckis, would express openness to return and make a Roger Rabbit sequel. Then of course you have Roger Rabbit's creator, Gary K. Wolf, who has already written several sequel books, including Who P -p -p Plugged Roger Rabbit in 1991, Who Whacked Roger Rabbit in 2013, and Jessica Rabbit Serious Business in 2022. Well, in 2013, he was also trying to make his own Roger Rabbit theatrical sequel, as well as trying to get Disney involved. This sequel was yet again a prequel, and a buddy comedy movie based on a 1952 movie called The Stooge, only it starred Roger Rabbit and Mickey Mouse, but this also didn't happen. In 2016, Robert Zemeckis said that a script for a Roger Rabbit sequel had been written, and that this time it wasn't a prequel, but an actual sequel, with the action now taking place in the 50s, and would feature a digital Bob Hoskins, whom passed away several years earlier, with the Eddie Valiant character returning as a ghost, 
But Zemeckis would go on to say that it's unlikely that Disney in its current state would make a new Roger Rabbit film, saying, quote, The current corporate Disney culture has no interest in Roger, and they certainly don't like Jessica at all. So as it happens, so far there have been no further misadventures of Roger Rabbit. But either way, you know, that doesn't really matter, as no matter what, we'll always have that 1988 original classic, a movie that has brought so many people joy over the decades, and still continues to do so. So the on-screen exploits of Roger Rabbit may have finished in 1988 in a one-and-done movie, but sequel or no sequel, the magic of that movie will live on forever. I love Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And let's be honest, it doesn't need a sequel. It's perfect the way that it is. It's always a film that I watch to go on a trip down memory lane, to get that excited and amazed feel that I used to get while watching it as a kid. And no matter how many times I watch it, it still never fails to impress me. Anyway, I'm Minty, and remember, dead tunes don't pay bills. <laughs> Apparently. See ya!